Today we'll be looking at The Last Spell, a game by Ishtar Games. It's a smaller dev studio of about 24 people who released the game with little fanfare but a ton of positive reviews. And what's even crazier is, if you go to their website, everything appears to be out of date. The release platforms state that it's available on PC and other to be determined, but if you go to the publisher's website, you can see that it's available on PS4 and PS5 as well. So this game appears to have been released on PC, PS4, and PS5. This review was done on PC, however. I cannot vouch for the functionality of the PS4 or PS5 versions because I didn't play them. If you like this content, subscribe and give a thumbs up. And I'd like to take a minute to thank the sponsor of this video, Opera GX. Tell me, have you ever looked at your task manager and saw how much of your resources your browser is using up and wonder if there was a better alternative to using a gigabyte of your memory to watch a friggin' video? then Opera GX is for you. I ran some tests and on average, Opera GX takes up less than a quarter of the resources of other browsers with similar functionality. Opera is also highly customizable, allowing for sounds to be played on keystrokes, clicks, and other notifications. And you can even have the browser play super aggressive music so you stay super angry even when you're looking at cute cat videos on YouTube. Opera can also be set up to set all compatible web pages to night mode, which saves your eyeballs from being gouged out by bright white lights. Opera GX also comes with an ad blocker built in, and from all accounts, it's pretty damn good at putting all those ads on a page in a bag and drowning them like kittens. This is especially useful for people who like to minimize the amount of extensions they have installed to minimize resource drain. And if that weren't enough, Opera GX comes with a free VPN in case you wanted to watch something on Netflix that wasn't available in your region, but you don't want to pay for a more feature-complete VPN. So why not give Opera GX a try by downloading it from the link in the description below. And now, on with the video. From the Steam description of The Last Spell, you'll spend your time defending the last bastion of humanity with your squad of heroes, exterminate fiendish monsters with magic and brute force by night, and rebuild your battered city defenses by day in this tactical RPG with roguelite mechanics. And yeah, you do do all those things, and it's a pretty apt description of the game. But what about the details? What is this game all about? I have a special name for games like this. I call them second monitor content. Basically, it's the type of game you play in windowed mode while you're at work while you do more engaging activities in a primary monitor, and every now and then you turn to the game and take a turn. That's not an insult. At least it's not meant to be. It's just how I personally enjoy playing these types of games because they do feel like they were meant to be enjoyed a bite at a time and not all at once. The premise of the game is simple. These guys in the center, those guys have to stay alive or you lose the game. What are they doing? They're trying to conjure the spell to end all spells, quite literally casting a spell that will destroy all the magic in the world. Meanwhile, the last remaining human settlements are under attack by monsters that wander in through the fog. You have three ways to keep the dudes in the center alive. You could create barriers, create structures that produce resources, and combat. This game lives and dies by its combat. And the city building, which I'll go into more in depth later, but the combat is the most important aspect of the game by far. You have a wide range of weapons and skills to choose from and tactics to keep your character safe and sound while doing enough damage to the enemy to put a dent in the seemingly endless encroaching horde. The game is turn-based. When nightfall hits, waves of monsters start pouring in and it's up to your heroes to stem the tide. You can slow them down with barricades or use corpses of your enemies to funnel them into a single line, but for the most part, you'll be looking for ways to remove large swaths of enemies off the playing board as possible every round, because after they die, more will come the next turn to replace them. And the odds can feel overwhelming, because when you see the whole screen full of enemies, it almost feels like you're cleaning up your room, and as soon as you finish, someone comes and dumps all your stuff back onto the floor. So it's a good thing that the game has a good variety of builds at its disposal. For instance, you might have a dual sword wielding knight who closes distance with a teleportation scroll, hacks a bunch of zombies to pieces, and then runs away with a massive pool of movement points. Or you might combine different weapon types to get a wider variety of ranges, like a rifle in one slot and a pistol in the other. One for long range sniping and another for big burst damage on groups. There's different damage resistances as well and each one acts a little different. For instance, 
block represents the amount of damage that just gets deleted. Armor is like a pool of temporary hit points that refreshes every round, while resistances will resist a certain amount of damage that makes it through your barriers. Dodge just negates the entire thing and is crazy. Each damage type reacts differently with each defense type. Physical damage does 200% damage to armor, while magic damage ignores 50% of resistances. Range damage is weak against dodge, and criticals do exactly what you think they do. Then there's enemy types, and each of these enemy variants have different mixes of defensive bonuses and types that you have to work your way around, which forces you to give each character different damage types, like mixing magic and melee, or melee and ranged, and each combination between. The combat has a lot of layers to it, but it's simple enough that you could just jump in and have fun. There's a lot of depth to this game, and it seems to borrow from a lot of other games in the genre that it's smashing together. This is a roguelite, tactical RPG. There's a lot of genres to smash together, but it seems to work here. First you have your characters. The weapon they wield determines what skills they get access to, a la Final Fantasy Tactics and their level up system is RNG, in that you get a list of stats to pick from, which are randomized, and you pick from that list. There are gray, green, and blue level ups, and the higher the rarity, the higher the boost the stat gets. But sometimes you get screwed by a set of stats that don't do anything for your build, in which case you can re-roll those stats. But every time you re-roll those stats, you lose two overall choices until you're down to just one so it's a hell of a gamble. Secondly, you have consumables, and consumables are a little misleading because they don't actually consume on use. They use up charges, and those charges refill every night, so a scroll or a potion becomes a permanent item that you can use per day. And in my opinion, they're OP, but in a good way, because you have to be OP to beat this game. It's no cakewalk. Third, we have the town building system which has a surprising amount of depth and complexity to it, even though I will admit I was surprised by how powerful gold generating buildings were. Gold becomes the key to winning because gold lets you build more structures and you can use those structures to generate more gold and buy new items for your crew of heroes. The structures become the other key to winning because of the buildings that generate items once per day. Getting five items after every fight helps you to kit your people out in the best gear, and anything that's trash you get sold to the shop to build more stuff. It's a really satisfying system. But, and you know me, and that means there's always a butt involved. The game starts out really slow. It starts out slow because you have few mechanics to depend on to make builds in the very beginning. Clearing the waves feels like a slog because your builds haven't matured or you lack the items and weapons to make builds work because you haven't unlocked them from the upgrade tree yet. For instance, it is very difficult to beat the first town, but would be a lot easier for instance if we could recruit six heroes instead of four, but you don't unlock that ability until you beat not only the first boss, but the first real town, and for me, that took about three to four tries before I was comfortable, but each of those runs got me to night six or seven, and it felt real bad to have to go back through all those nights again just to have another shot at the boss. Everything feels like work in those first few hours. Also, unlocks are given to you through a progression system where you do X a certain amount of times, and as a reward, you might get a new set of armor, or a building, or a useful passive effect. This is a rewarding system, however, in the beginning, you have no idea which items are good to unlock, and which ones are ones you don't want to unlock, and since the game is heavily RNG, unlocking a useless piece of armor means you might get it appearing in the shop, even though you never had a use for it. This means that when you make it to the near the end of the game, you have a very good chance to not get stuff related to your build, which means that some runs go better than others, and there's just not a whole lot that can be done about it. That can really sour a player in a game where battles can last 15 to 25 minutes and there's seven battles to live through, and in the late game, 14 nights. 14! Only to lose in the last two battles because RNG hasn't been kind and you get to do it all over again. That's not very fun to me. That's grinding. But that's also what this genre is all about. But most roguelites don't make you repeat four and a half hours of gameplay. I feel like a lot of these games are all about grinding out unlocks until you permanently are overpowered and you find a build that works. So can I really fault the game for doing it? I think the difference is the time commitment. 
Peglin and Loop Hero don't feel like it takes a long time to blow through a run, even though runs can last upwards of an hour or two, and in this game, I felt every minute of the last spell because it expects a lot out of you. Peglin expects very little out of you but to aim, fire, and watch, so in contrast to a game where you micromanage everything versus a game that lets you watch the action happen, the micromanage game is going to feel like every moment of that runtime. That can be a good thing if you like games with a lot of things to manage or you just have a lot of time to blow. Personally, I would have liked it if there were more towns with different layouts but less phases each town. But what you get is what you get, and it didn't completely push me away from the game. In fact, I went out and watched several tutorials that helped me, and I'll link them in the description below in case you're struggling with the difficulty. So that shows that the game has something that addicted me, at least early on, even despite the slow moving progression. This feels like one of those kind of things I need to qualify with a, if you like these types of slow moving games, then you'll like this slow moving game, which is crazy to hear in a review. Like how am I supposed to know if I like games like this if I've never played the game you're reviewing? The main problem I had with this game is that it doesn't respect your time. You're doomed to ill-fated runs for the first dozen or so hours due to the way the unlocks work, and that fact becomes clear to you once you start playing the game that it will be insanely tough to progress until you've unlocked a few more essences. So the entire beginning of this game is so tedious and pointless that you'll wonder why you're playing the game, because the beginning of the game isn't fun to play. But the deeper you into the progression that you get, the more fun the game becomes, unless you see through the mirage and realize it's all pointless. Another thing that the game does is run great. I mean, it ran fast, it ran reliably, the entire 25 hours that I put into it, so you don't have to worry about performance. I ran it on two different PCs and each performed rock solid. No frame drops, no crash to desktop, nothing. However, by hour 10 of the game, I was really having a hard time getting back into the swing of things. I, I knew my run was doomed from the first two days of gameplay, but I still had another three to four days worth of hordes to fight through before I was done and had to start over again. It's just not a fun feeling to know that you're doomed from the very start and either have to dump out of the run or try to complete it with a gimp set of heroes. But I made myself go back into the game and play it until I made some progress at the very least, and I discovered Boundless Mode. And in Boundless Mode, you can customize your game with modifiers like less waves per night, and it's the game's difficulty selector. I found that the game was much more interesting after that, and as I could do away with certain mechanics that annoyed me, or at least minimize their impact. I learned how to play the game much quicker that way, and was eventually able to play without it. The music is good. It's really good, in fact. It just feels like the kind of music that you hear in a recent shooter when the combat kicks in, while some of the more ambient tracks are more subdued but still feel groovy as hell. I like the soundtrack on its own as a piece of music, so I think that speaks volumes, and I've had the music stuck in my head for a few days now. The sound effects, on the other hand, get the job done, but I wouldn't say anything stood out. Which can be a good thing or a bad thing depending on where you stand on it. I prefer sound effects to only call attention to themselves when it's important to do so. I'd call the art style anime, but that's not quite it. It's stylized pixel art, which can look cartoony, but it is very high quality, and I personally dug the graphics. Everything looks like it was done by the same set of artists, so there's a cohesiveness to the art style that may be missing with studios that farm out their artwork. And the characters are highly customizable, with different looks that they wear with certain armor types and hats. The spell effects and weapon effects all feel like they have impact and are nice and flashy when they need to be. The buildings, on the other hand, can be difficult to tell apart, so most buildings lean on UI icons for quick identification, but even the buildings look nice. And the art is large enough that it's aesthetically pleasing as well, with all the detail packed into such a small amount of pixels. It's a very nice looking game. Like, the art style makes me feel like I'm a teen again, playing Final Fantasy Tactics on the PlayStation, and having a great time grinding out experience and leveling up jobs. This game reminds me a lot of that game in more than one way. So as far as the story is concerned, well, there's really not a whole lot to it. It's just exposition mostly. You do get some story after each seal is broken, but for the most part, the story is just window dressing. You find out everything that you need to find out in the opening cinematic, 
So this isn't one of those kind of story focused games. It's much more gameplay focused. So you won't be getting an 800 word rant on the story because there's not much here to critique. It's a very cool premise, however, and at the bare minimum, you need that to make the whole game work. The premise being something that the player is fighting for or a reason to fight to say it another way. So the game is $24.99 on Steam, and I feel like maybe that's a bit of a high price for a game like this, but that's just my opinion. And here's the thing, I'm not going to sit here and talk a whole bunch of bullshit about how I like this game, because the truth is, I didn't really like it that much. There's a lot to love, actually. The systems and the art style are the reasons I like this game at all, but the main gameplay loop of combat was tedious to me. I liked building characters, but felt like the combat was akin to cleaning out a hoarder's house only to come back the next day to discover that they put all their shit back in the house and added 24 aquariums to their collection. I'm being quite careful right now about how I say this because that's not to say I wouldn't recommend this game. I actually would, but I think I would recommend it more if it were on sale. It's just not my type of game, but that's not to say that this isn't the game for you. So if you're a fan of turn-based games like XCOM and roguelikes like Loop Hero, this game might be worth checking out for you. Here's a data point that might help you decide. Out of the over 8,000 reviews that this game had on Steam, only 2,900 of those reviews had over 10 hours in the game. That tells you that only the most hardcore fans of the game stuck around and played enough of the game to get past the first town before they recommended the game to other people. An even more striking stat is the fact that only 20% of players actually have beaten the first town. So either people are buying the game and not playing it, or the game is too hard for your average player, or alternatively, the game didn't live up to their expectations. And what about replay value? Well, there's a little here, but overall, not a lot of content. There's an apocalypse mode that gets added each time you beat a town, and the level determines how difficult each enemy is. It's a challenge mode, like trying to <laughs> to a Victoria's Secret catalog after years of exposure to internet porn. You can do it, but it's gonna take a long time. I'm giving this one a 7 out of 10, even though it wasn't for me, there's still something to appreciate, and I'm sure others might find enjoyment where I didn't. 